Finding the right portable keyboard can be difficult. There are a ton of brands, different options, and a lot of features. Today, Ted and I are going to go over the seven most common mistakes people make when purchasing a keyboard. Hi, this is Ted with Alamo Music Center in downtown San Antonio, Texas. And I'm Patrick Marr. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, please check out our other videos, our other channels. We have multiple YouTube channels, bringing you guys lots of content. Please subscribe to those and sign up for notifications. Leave us some comments. We really love to interact with you and appreciate all the support. Ted, this is yeah. a common thing we see all the time. People, Every day, numerous shoppers. People purchasing their first portable keyboard. Sometimes it's not their first. Sometimes they're, they have a grand piano at home and they need to get a portable keyboard. Um, there's lots of options out there, as we did state before, but now more than ever. How, like you, You've been in the piano industry for a long time. Oof. There's more manufacturers than, than you could probably list on a, in a small notebook. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because there's so many options and they flood the market with, okay, we have this option, we have this one, we have this one, this other, and they, they're all portable keyboards um, and it's got 88 keys, it's got 63 keys, it's got 73 keys, it's got weighted action, unweighted action. It's got all these confusing words. 61 keys is and, the other thing too. Oh, 61, yeah, and, it's, and this is for a beginner and it's... And it's uh, it's harder to buy a keyboard almost than it is to like buy a car or buy like to pick the right thing and feel comfortable with that purchase. Right. Well, the first thing is that when people come in is portability. There's two things. Mm -hmm. There's uh, just your regular person that plays that wants to go camping and take a keyboard, and then there's the professional, and then there's a lot of times there's students on vacation that are traveling. I've sold a number of them to RV owners, mm -hmm. and they need a keyboard in there so they can yeah. practice. So the right application is the first thing to, that you need to consider uh, besides what your budget is. Yeah, and so so our number one is know what the purpose of this is for. And of course, that's brought you guys here. That's kind of an overarching um, uh, thing here. If you're buying for a student, if you're buying for yourself, if you're experienced, there can be a lot of options out there. So know just, and, and hopefully we, we help you with this, but know exactly what you're looking for. Sure, and if it's for a beginner or an intermediate student, the one thing that, that you really want to uh, consider the whole time you're out looking to buy an instrument is that it's not just the cost of the instrument. There's there's some cost to the learning as well. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times people will commit to, well, all I have is a $1,000 and we're getting a portable keyboard and that's it. Well, that doesn't leave any money for lessons. Yeah. For a teacher. And, and, I, and I think it's funny. I, I hear this a lot. It's like, okay, we're going to, you know, my six-year-old's going to start. We started ballet last year, didn't stick with it. We're only going to spend $100, $200 on a keyboard, and that's all. We're going to, we're going to buy this, and if they like it, we'll, we'll maybe start Let's lessons. See where it goes from there. Yeah, and, and it's one of the saddest things because I almost want to tell them, like, don't buy this. It's, if, you're not, if you're willing to commit to the purchase but not to the, the actual application of this, um, it can be, I think, disheartening for a kid or for sure. the motivation isn't there. Um, Just buying a keyboard doesn't automatically make the student or someone know something. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you have to use it and apply it and then learn and apply it and apply it. And so we, we often tell, tell parents this. It, it's if you're going to be if you are doing this right and you're planning for the purchase of this and for lessons, think about what you're going to be spending in a year's time, even six months time. If it's a six month experiment, lessons are not cheap. They're you're looking at at least maybe one hundred dollars a month. Um, that's kind of breaks down, to you know, thirty dollars sure. a week, twenty five dollars a week. Um, if you're paying that out for six months, that's six hundred dollars investment that you're making in just lessons. And if you're buying the cheapest thing you can find, a lot of the times that that equation doesn't really it's not balanced. It's not balanced, and a lot of the times, if you're going to be committing these long-term payments, you should also be committing to an instrument that can hold up and keep keep someone interested and in playing and having a good time for that amount of True. time. And a lot of times, people will go to either a pawn shop or a second-hand shop or even a, a, a yard sale or garage sale and find a keyboard and say, oh, we picked it up because they wanted a keyboard. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, those aren't real. I mean, they're musical instruments. They make a noise. But is it really something that you could learn on or is it more along the line of a, of a novelty or a toy type of keyboard? And so Ted brought us naturally to number two on the list. He bought a toy keyboard, which some things might be better than no things. But a lot of the times, if you are buying a toy, you're, it's something that's not going to be something that's practicable on. And so if you think about something with small keys, something that's going to be very 
Mm -hmm. Lightweight, you buy when Toys R Us was around, you'd buy it from there. But people buy these things off Amazon, and they're like, "Oh, that's good enough. It's a mini, it's a mini piano, and it will be good for my my four year old, mm -hmm. five year old." Um, when really it has, it's not even in really the piano family. They need something more along the line of real instrument. And there was a time about twenty five or thirty years ago where a really good standard for what's a good keyboard to learn on and what's one that you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. And again. This is 25 or 30 years ago, I used to tell people, well, if it requires batteries, that's probably going to be more like a toy uh, keyboard as opposed to one that requires a power supply mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, an adapter. Now that's not the case anymore because I, I can think of a couple keyboards that Yamaha makes that push over the $2,500 uh, limit. They're portable and they do run on batteries yeah. as well as an AC uh, power cord as well. So, so so you don't only need to be cautious of, of purchasing a toy keyboard in, in, in purpose of a keyboard that you're going to be practicing on and that will be a usable instrument. Our third thing is they bought something that has the wrong power supply. And so this is re very common, especially in that $150 price range you're gonna see a lot of the same instruments online and it's gonna be, okay, this one's for $120 and this one's for 150, but they look like the same. If you read the fine print, one of them's gonna include a power adapter and one of them's gonna be just battery operated. So make sure you're looking at that. That's a really, I think, an overlooked detail a lot of the times, especially with online shopping. Make sure that you know exactly what's coming in the box because a lot of the times you're gonna purchase something, you found it for cheaper on this website, but it's not including the power adapter, which is, I think, a game changer. You don't wanna keep switching out batteries. A lot of times kids will leave an, a, an item on and the battery just drains and it's and it's every couple weeks you're switching the batteries. I always suggest make sure you get it with a power supply, especially in that $150 range where it's something that's going to be plugged in. Make sure. sure you're purchasing and you know what is actually coming. It brings us really quick to number four. What, what does it come with? Does it come with accessories? Does it not come with accessories? I, I think a lot of times people put a budget in their head and they're like, I'm I'm comfortable spending three, four hundred dollars on a beginner portable keyboard. What does it What does it come with? And, and they and they max out their budget and they go, okay, I, I can buy this keyboard for three ninety nine. I'm, I'm comfortable spending that. Doesn't have a stand. Doesn't have headphones. Doesn't have a power adapter. Doesn't have any kind of uh, compatible software or loadable uh, applications. Possibly, I mean, there's a no lot pedal. Of, no pedals. Sometimes there's no pedal included. Um, and so knowing the accessories that your keyboard comes with, if it has a music rest or not. Um, this is a very important thing because it can get confusing very quickly. And a lot of times you'll see these bundles that come with all this fun stuff, but does it have the necessary things? And I think this kind of, a lot of these will be answered with a teacher that can walk you through. Teacher or guidance, because mm -hmm. a lot of times in this price range, you can buy a keyboard that works and then you can buy one that doesn't work besides the battery and the power supplies and the accessories. A lot of times it's the wrong kind of action on the keyboard. In other words, it's a spring-loaded action. Mm -hmm. There's no kind of uh, weighted, uh, uh, weighted action or any kind of yeah. uh, grading to the keyboard at all. So, so not only is it very important to know the accessories it comes with, we always recommend a stand, a bench, a pedal. These are things that are almost necessary with the instrument. Sometimes people are like, oh, I can just put the keyboard on my desk. Or, and that's okay for some people, but if you're really trying to get things going, making sure you have the right accessories, and there's lots of guides to what you need for a keyboard. In our mind, it's it's the stand, it's the it's the pedal, um, and the keyboard. And it's correct ergonomics. It's, if, these are, if the student is a piano student, they should be sitting a certain height off the ground with the right kind of level for their for their arms, bent at their elbows with the wrist and to, to allow them to play the instrument properly. And so look for that guidance, look for that teacher, because like Ted said, they're also gonna help us with this next one. What's the right action? Which is a lot of the, the number one question people have is, well, my teacher said something about the keys. They need to be weighted. They or... need to be censored. They need to be weighted. And so there's, there's these terms people use, weighted keys. Wood keys. Wood keys. There's uh, uh, touch sensitivity. There's these things about the action, and that's how the actual keys respond to you playing. And so most common thing that we hear from teachers that are, are teaching kids through teenagers is they need weighted, graded keys. And so what does that mean? Weighted means that it's gonna feel and be weighted similar to an acoustic instrument, like, a, like an acoustic upright piano or a, a grand piano. And the graded, what does graded mean? Graded means that it's, it's gradual from, from the bass notes. It's gonna be a little bit heavier and it gradually gets lighter as it goes up to the top. So that there's graded weight 
for bass sections, mid to lows, treble, and all the way on up to the top. So number five on our list was make sure you're looking at the right action for your, your instrument, and that's going to affect how pricey it is. Um, of course, the, the, more, the more you spend on it, the, the, higher, the higher quality of the action is being made. But there's some affordable options. I've, we've done videos on this before, but for, ham, for weighted keys, what is the most affordable option for you? And there's some really good options out there. Um, and then also... Some wonderful so, options and graded keys. Yeah, and so number six on our list too. This is, this is an interesting one because it's, it's hard to know which features are right for you. It kind of harkens back to the first one where know what the application you, you want it for. But sometimes people overbuy on features and they underbuy on the use of the instrument. Right. Um, and so they see, okay, this is two hundred dollars, and look at all these cool buttons. They're all over it, and they're in there. They see you can do, you know, it's got this screen on it, and it's got, you know, all these different buttons. That means it's got. That means it's cool. That means it can. It can do a lot, but does it have a basic metrotome in it so you can just practice your timing? And does it have the ability to maybe record a brief passage so you can listen back to whether you're playing it correctly or not? And how, does the, how is the action on and it? And how is the action? These are useful features that sometimes a teacher will recommend. I don't know that a teacher's going to recommend that you go out and get a 16-track recording studio in your mm -hmm. keyboard, unless, of course, you're doing mixing, and that's the kind of uh, uh, education and music that you're looking to fulfill. But for the most part, just to learn the instrument, there are some essential things like a metronome that allows you to, to change the time signature, not just where it counts four, and not where it has the heavy downbeat on one. A lot of times you, you want something that's almost has a soft bass on one and then a hit somewhere in there, you get mm -hmm. a little bit of a rhythm track, and some of them do have rhythm tracks. In yeah, so it's just important to know which features you need, and a lot of times if you go into a music store, if you look on websites, sometimes they look convoluted, and they can be, and it's important to, to realize how your mind works and how even a child's mind works, and what are those necessary things that are going to help progress a student into playing, or what are those things that you need, like a metronome, like recording technology, like a good action, like a good piano sound that has dynamic range, good sensors on the keys so that you can express that dynamic range. There's a lot of things that get thrown out there, and we'll, you'll see a feature list. You know, there's 600 sounds on this. Do you need 600 sounds, or are you just learning it for piano? And so I just really make sure you guys check out what exactly you need, because a lot of the times people overbuy on the feature category, I right. think. Um, and then lastly, this is portable keyboards we're talking about, and portable, I think, is the keyword. Um, and so know the weight, know the size, know that there's a lot of options here. And just because it looks like something on the internet or just because it, it, it looks or feels a certain way doesn't mean, doesn't mean how portable it is. I'd like to define portability. Portability Please. for me is a keyboard that one person, regardless of age and stature, can pick it up and, go and, and move it from one spot to another transport it into a car and transport it to another place. And I say that because other than a little kid, a person should be able to pick up a portable keyboard. Mm -hmm. and we have portable keyboards that go from under 30 pounds to over 75 pounds. And that's not something that, you know, a 70 to 80 year old grandma is going to want to pick up and carry out yeah. to church on Sunday. So the portability has to be defined. And that's again, the end user. Yeah. But at the same time, I've had to haul keyboards where I, you, someone helps you load it up, you go to the gig, and you got to find a guy to help you unload it. That's not necessarily portability. Yeah, and so even with portability, it's, it's I think, important to identify if that is actually a concern of yours or if the price category is what you're more looking at. And so again, with portability, if you go to a store, a music store, if you go try out some, some keyboards, you'll quickly realize the heavier something is, and if it has a stand built in, and if it has all these features, you might like it more if, if portability isn't the key issue for you. And so we did want to bring this up in, up in the video because sometimes people aren't actually looking for a portable keyboard, but the price range is attracted to, attractive to them. And they start, start, start going on this, on this trail, and they're like, well, I'm looking for a portable keyboard, of course, because I don't want to spend a lot of money. And sometimes they realize there's affordable options for... Uh, for a, a, like more a of a piano -like digital like substitute, yeah, yeah, digital piano. And so we did want to bring that up. Um, we have done videos on digital pianos. What are the, what are some of the good options um, and kind of the differences between a portable keyboard and a digital piano um, can be very kind of a, a broad spectrum. But Ted, thank you again. These are the seven things. 
the, the mistakes, the most common ones that we see um, people make when purchasing a portable keyboard. If you guys have any questions, you can find us online at alamomusic.com where we have a chat agent available. He can answer any of your questions. He or she can answer any of your questions. Um, thank you guys for watching. Ted Barslew, I'm Patrick Marr. And make sure you check out some of our videos and leave us comments. If there's anything else that you guys want to see, we'd love to bring it to you. Thanks.